thank you very, very much uh, for having me. I appreciate this greatly. Um, let me begin by uh, offering some surmises about who you are in addition to being very talented and creative people who work in the area of design. Um, I'm also assuming that you are at least somewhat typical of the general American population in at least one important respect. As of this morning, the polling data show that Congress has the approval of approximately one in eight Americans and is disapproved by about four out of five Americans. Uh, that is, on a good day, Congress might have the approval of up to 15%, and on a bad day, Congress might be disapproved of by up to 88% of the country. Uh, the president is better compared to Congress, that is, the current presidential approval ratings are, I think, in the low 40s. Even the Supreme Court, which is the uh, traditionally the most approved of the national institutions, is now below 50%. Uh, the one national institution that seems to continue to have the confidence of the American people, and you can regard this as good news or bad news, depending on your politics, is the military. Um, but if one looks at the central civilian organizations, and for, there have been a number of articles in the last couple of days about plummeting confidence in this uh, Centers for Disease Control, it's going down, down, down. It's also the case that if you ask people a very standard polling question, do you believe the country is going the wrong direction or the right direction? Uh, most of the country, that is approximately two thirds, believes the country is going in the wrong direction. Um, I think the, the, in, in the highest poll with regard to, no, the country is going the right direction shows about 31% of the people. Uh, there are other polls showing that only about a quarter of the population believes the country is going in the right direction. I confess I'm with the majority that believes the country is going the wrong direction. I'm with the majority who has lost confidence in Congress and in many of our institutions. Uh, but that makes me a typical American. And I think it would you know, be quite extraordinary and very interesting, quite frankly, to social scientists if you in this audience were suffused with great approval of our national institutions at a time when most people aren't, what would account for that? Uh, so that's one assumption I come out with, that we're all in this together and are more likely than not unhappy um, about the current situation in the United States and almost certainly abroad. Now, then the question, one after one diagnoses an illness or identifies an illness, you've got something wrong with you. The obvious question is, well, what causes it? What can be done about it? And here uh, one sees uh, just tons of different sorts of um, analyses as to what is wrong. Uh, if Larry Lessig, my friend and sometime uh, co-teacher at the Harvard Law School were here, he would be talking very, very eloquently about uh, the corruption tied to the way we finance elections. There are other people who could talk about the importance of the fragmentation of the media. Uh, there are some people, and increasingly, I think I'm probably one of them, who might say, well, you know, it may simply be that the country is too large, um, that we've gone from a country of roughly four million people spread between Maine and the southern border of Georgia, east bank of the Mississippi to a country of about 310 million people extending to the mid-Pacific and depending on your view of Puerto Rico into the Caribbean, uh, and that may be just too many people in order to have a functioning government. Uh, we were talking backstage about the interesting phenomenon in California going on right now of uh, movements to secede from California and form smaller states. Um, there are many things that might be generating that, and I don't want to take a stand one way or the other on the merits, but certainly one plausible view is that California is just too big to be governed effectively uh, by a single government, and it might be useful to make it smaller. Uh, I spent last week um, in the UK, um, and what 
has recently gone on in Scotland, I think is enormously interesting and is going to have very real implications, not only in the politics of the United Kingdom, but also perhaps on politics elsewhere in terms of the proper size of government and, and the like. Uh, so that is uh, one theme that I begin with. This might relate to what the earlier uh, discussants were talking about, optimism or pessimism. Um, um, if you simply say, well, a lot of people aren't happy, that suggests a certain kind of pessimism. But as would be true of the medical analogy, you go to a doctor uh, and you are told the bad news that you've got something wrong with you, but then the good news is actually we can design a treatment plan so things will get better and you walk out uh, maybe not completely skipping with happiness but realizing uh, that this too will pass and in fact you might be better than you ever were in the past. Um, so I now want to turn to two quotes from the Federalist uh, essays written by Madison J. Um, and um, Hamilton. Um, to some extent, I have 15 minutes, and I, I very much want to stay within the 15 minutes because I think conversation may be more important than my remarks, to make the equivalent of a sermon. And a sermon begins with you know, proof text. So in the American civil religion, one can hardly do better than turning to the Federalist um, as one of our sacred texts. And so I want to ask you to look, first of all, at almost the literal beginning of the 85 essays that we call The Federalist. Uh, it happened to have been written by Alexander Hamilton, but published under the name Publius. And what he writes is, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether the societies of men and women are really capable or not of establishing good government from affection and choice, or whether they are foremost, forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Now, one way of reading this is historically, that Hamilton is making the point that Americans in the late 18th century were given the almost unique opportunity to design a new government, not simply to accept thoughtlessly something that had been handed down from generations before. And this is really extraordinary. Are societies of men and women capable of establishing, that is, designing good government from reflection and choice? Now, the reason I think this is relevant in 2014 and is not merely an, of historical interest is whether Hamilton is speaking to us as well as to the audience of 1787. Obviously, he was not writing for an audience in 2014. But the question is, and this would be true with any historical document, do we read it simply as what people in the past thought? Or does it really speak to us today and suggest something about what we're capable of? So the important question is whether we, the people, to obviously borrow the first three words of the United States Constitution, are capable of exercising reflection and choice about our government, or whether we are simply stuck in a series of institutions designed 225 years ago and in fundamental ways left unchanged over the last 225 years. Whether we say, well, this is just the government we live under, and we are incapable of exercising reflection and choice, where choice might mean changing the form of government, uh, or it would be dangerous to do so, because quite frankly, we don't really trust one another to come up with wise judgment um, and um, we'd simply be opening a Pandora's box if we suggested that we should have the kind of courage, 
of our ancestors to ask, are we being well served by the government? Um, Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, began one of his speeches to the Philadelphia Convention by describing the existing system of government in the United States under the Arts Confederation as imbecilic. In Federalist 15, Hamilton refers to the American government as imbecilic. That's why we needed radical change. And let me tell you, the Constitution of 1787 was an extraordinarily radical, radically different design from the uh, Articles of the Federation. We're not in the habit of talking that way. Even people who denounce the American government as dysfunctional, and you can read pundits of the left, right, and center who freely denounce the current American political system as dysfunctional, end up saying, well, it's because we don't have the right kinds of leaders. It's because we're too polarized. It's because of the role of money, all of which may be true. But what I confess has turned me into something of a crank is that none of them connect the dots and say, you know, part of the explanation may be that we're living under a constitution from 225 years ago that even if you say was well designed for America in 1787, is terribly designed for the America of 2014. And when we think of political reform, and if you know, we think of the elections that are coming up in just 10 days, it's not merely that we want to elect better leaders and we want to do this, that, or the other, but we might ask, well, to what extent should we be thinking of quite radically changing the political system, or at the very, very least, having a national conversation about whether we are well served by the system that was designed for us by very capable men, but they were thinking in terms of 1787. They were not thinking in terms of 2014. How could they? Um, uh, that really would be a utopian notion. So my other favorite quote from the Federalist, this was written by Madison. It's the conclusion of Federalist 14. Uh, and what he says is not the glory of the people that while they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of former times and other nations, they have not suffered a blind veneration for antiquity, for custom, or for names to overrule the suggestions of their own good sense, the knowledge of their own situation, and the lessons of their own experience. Well, let me translate that very slightly. The blind veneration for names could be synonymous with the kind of veneration we have for the founders and for the Constitution they gave us, which is highly paradoxical, because I actually like the founders. I think that they were really inspiring. And I think what's inspiring is what is revealed in the first quotation, the willingness to engage in reflection and choice. Um, and then as you um, look toward the end of the quotation from Federalist uh, 14, uh, happily for America, happily trust for the whole human race, they pursued a new and more noble course than simply sticking with the existing reality which they thought was imbecilic. That is the model that we don't follow. Instead, we tend to say, well, they were great men, which many of them undoubtedly were, uh, and therefore we honor them best by sticking to what they gave us. That seems not only to dishonor what was best about them, but also to contribute to the malaise uh, that we live in, uh, where there is not only the justified short-run pessimism about our current political lives, but a much more fundamental long-term pessimism or alienation that leads people to believe that really nothing can be done 
about changing institutions that clearly do not serve us well, because in fact the Constitution, among other things, does make it very difficult to engage in transformative change. I should say the national constitution does. State constitutions are much more flexible. I like state constitutions in many ways more than I like the national constitution. I wish more lawyers paid more attention to differences between the na national constitution and state constitutions. Uh, what I want is a new constitutional convention. Um, uh, it is not because I have in my pocket a model for the new, improved Levinson Constitution, though I do have some ideas as to how we could, in fact, have a better political system than what we have now. But the most important thing is to generate a national conversation among people interested in what an increasing number of lawyers and political scientists call constitutional design. What sorts of institutions fit the realities of 21st century life, and what sorts of institutions really condemn us to further systematic unhappiness and a belief, whether you're left, right, or center, that the national government, perhaps any government, but particularly the national government, is simply unlikely to function well if you define function as being able to respond to the problems of the day. Um, and I will I'll conclude by making uh, sim simply a surmise that people interested in design to some extent can be divided into those who focus on aesthetics, beauty, uh, the sheer pleasure you get in an object, uh, and functionality that what is it supposed to do, and if it generates a good output, then who cares if it's a little bit ugly. And I think, I wrote an earlier book called Our Undemocratic Constitution, making the argument that the Constitution was radically undemocratic, which I think is true. I came to the conclusion that nobody much cared, that what people really care about is outputs. Is the political system serving us well? Um, that's the function of a polity, not to look lovely or to fit some political theorist notion of what a properly democratic system would be, but rather to fulfill the wants and needs of the population to engender a belief that the government is in fact effectively responding to the challenges. So my more recent book, uh, focuses on the kind of polling data that I began with, the unhappiness of people with regard simply to the outputs of government. They're not getting what they think we need. And as I say, whether you're left, right, or center doesn't matter because I have no doubt that you have a set of challenges that you believe the national government simply is not uh, responding to, and quite frankly, if you think it through, you really don't think the elections coming up are going to make any difference because we're going to be as gridlocked and as incapable of responding effectively to the challenges we face after next Tuesday as we are today uh, and, in fact, into the foreseeable future. But I've gone over my time, and I'm very, very eager to get to the conversation um, with Nathan. I thank you very much for showing up in the morning and uh, hearing me out. That was awesome. Have a seat. My head is brimming with things I want to talk to you about now, and there's not even going to be enough time to do that eventually. Uh, start tweeting your questions if you have questions. Um, so the first thing I'll start with is this idea of a new constitutional convention. Um, first of all, I don't know if you were here yesterday, but we have two great people to help you uh, frame those, con uh, create those conversations, because you're right, that's really the value of it, is, is a national conversation. So I hope Bob and Lisa can help you whenever you can make that happen, and maybe Jake, who's after you, um, creating experiences around a new constitutional convention. But my first question is, given the discourse that we have today in both politics and in the, and, and, and the and news and in public, could, could that even be successful? The only honest answer is who knows. Um, 
one of the realities of contemporary American life, and this dismays me, obviously, is that there are no recognized national political leaders or pundits who are even willing to suggest the need for any kind of constitutional structural change. And I should emphasize, incidentally, that the parts of the Constitution I'm most interested in are what most people falsely believe are the dull and boring parts of the Constitution, that you may have memories of civics courses from long ago, uh, though I think that a lot of school systems have just basically dropped civics courses, but where you came to the how a bill becomes a law, how many votes does it take to override a presidential veto, these courses were often taught by coach, they were when I was going to school in North Carolina many years ago, uh, nobody was very interested in, they were th thought of as dull and boring topics. So contemporary civics courses where they're offered are often much more interesting because you throw out question to kids about, well, what about free speech? What about affirmative action? All of which are very interesting questions, but I'm as passionately concerned about how bills become law, or more accurately, why most bills never stand a chance in hell of becoming law. I'm very concerned about the fact that we are, most of us learn, uh, and if you take a citizenship test, you would describe the American system as a bicameral system. There are two houses of Congress. Um, in fact, I argue that we're a tricameral system because the presidential veto power makes the president an essential actor in the legislative process, and this is no small matter. Uh, one of the reasons why the election next week will probably make little or no difference with regard to Obamacare unless a Republican Congress simply refuses to, to finance the government and threatens complete shutdown is because the, is the president can veto the legislation. Now, if you like Obamacare, you say, isn't that wonderful? If you don't, you would say, well, look, the people have spoken, whether, whether that's a true description or not is another matter, and something ought to be able to happen. And then you discover, no, nothing happens because you need both houses of Congress plus the president, and it turns out that it's very hard to get very often. And I think these are issues of yeah. tremendous importance. And as I described myself earlier as so having turned into something of a crank, um, you read these columns, and I often pick on Tom Friedman, because Friedman, to his credit, very often writes columns about the dysfunctionality of the American political system. Uh, and how we really need to do something about it. But what he has literally never done yeah. is to connect the dots to the political system that the Constitution structures and to say, well, you know, we might need to reorganize. The Alfred Sloan model for GM might have been great then. in 1920 you know, it doesn't work that well. Not at all. 21st century. I think the 70s pro proved <laughs> that, right? Um, so I'm going to make an offer, and that is when you were talking about civics classes, and I, and I must have had one, I can't remember it, yep, that's um, <laughs> which is probably the problem, right? Um, we have a community. I have a new degree, in fact, in civic innovation that we just launched. I am offering you students and designers in a community that can turn that civics class into a design class. Mm -hmm. We can, you know, what a better, we, we know that one of the best ways to learn something is to actually make it, and you learn through making or think through making. So why shouldn't civics class be about designing legislation? And yeah, you learn how it works now and how it's supposed to work, et cetera, along the way, rather than just focusing on the rules and the regulations. Well, because the rules and the regulations, I mean, designing legislation presumes a given structure for how bills become laws or why bills will not become laws. Or creating a new structure. That's right. So um, I'm not opposed to lots of people getting interested in designing a much better medical care system than one we have now. But if you ask yourself, why does the United States have such a bizarre medical care system? It is in part because of the ocean 
within which policymakers swim. And unlike the ocean, which you can view as you know, created by nature, created by God, just there, there's not much we can do about it, um, that's not true of political institutions. That, in fact, is the inspiration of the framers, that they were willing to diagnose an existing political structure as imbecilic, and then try to design a different structure. So, you know, I'm not opposed to policy yeah. discussions. That'd be crazy. But I do think that what weakens a lot of the policy discussions is that they don't go on and say, well, why aren't these sensible policies likely to be passed? And at that point, you have to talk about the structure right. of the House of Representatives, the structure of the Senate, the structure of the presidency, and the, the Supreme design, Court. And the design of policy. That, yeah. That's right. That's right. Was there was a, there's a great question that someone tweet, tweeted about, um, is there a constitution somewhere in the world that you think is, uh, would be a better model for us in the, in the start of the 21st century for the US government uh, that's more, more set up to deal with our challenges yeah. today? You know, I think there are lots of constitutions, not only around the world, but in the United States. The subtitle of my book is America's 51 Constitutions. One of the things that is just terrible, frankly, about the way we teach constitutional law, especially at elite law schools, the higher up you go in the pecking order, the more likely it is that people will think there's only one constitution in the United States. Wow. That is the US Constitution. That's false. There are 51 constitutions. Uh, the United States Constitution, plus the constitution of each of the states. And the state constitutions can be really interesting. New York, for example, uh, and I wouldn't offer the New York government as a model <laughs> of government, but there's one feature of the New York Constitution that I absolutely love. That is, I think it's every 20 years, the citizenry of New York is given the opportunity to vote up or down, should we have a new convention to discuss the adequacy of the New York con con uh, Constitution. The fact is, depending on how you count, New York is now operating under either its fourth or fifth constitution. Uh, many states have had multiple constitutions because they realize that it's just silly to believe that a constitution, even drafted by the best and the brightest, in 1838 or 1820 or 1787 will necessarily serve us well. Rhode Island next week will be voting on whether or not to have a new constitutional convention. Uh, there are 14 states in the United right. States that do that. The United States Constitution doesn't. I much prefer the 14 state constitutions over the US Constitution. Iceland is a really, really interesting um, uh, example for people interested in constitutional design uh, because there was a popular movement uh, that really relied on open source and mass participation. It was, it's often described as the first constitution designed through the internet. It failed because it didn't get parliamentary approval. Well, that's, I think, a really, really interesting point that one might readily expect that transformative yeah. designs will not get the approval of institutions who are going to lose their power, power or status. So think again of one of the genius decisions made by the framers in 1787. First of all, the existing imbecilic Articles of Confederation said any constitutional amendments must get the unanimous approval of the state legislatures. 13 states, and you need the legislatures of 13 states. Article 7, which is never taught. Nobody knows about Article 7 because there's no contemporary importance. Article 7 says this constitution will come into being when it's ratified by conventions in nine states. Nine is not 13. Rhode Island didn't attend the Constitutional Convention because they said, look, we're protected. 
by Article 13, will have the ability to veto any changes made in Philadelphia. They turned out to be wrong because the framers said, we're not going to give Rhode Island the ability to veto these necessary changes. Furthermore, we're not going to go through state legislatures because one could readily predict, I mean, it was touch and go, even in the conventions. The New York vote was 30 to 27 in favor of, the, at the convention, 30 to 27 in favor of the Constitution. One can readily imagine that the vote would have gone the other way had it been the New York legislature. So they said, okay, let's skip the legislature. So what, yeah. but one of the things in Iceland, even though there was a lot that was radically transformative about the design process, at the end of the day, they said, we're not gonna be revolutionaries. We're gonna go through the existing parliament, and guess what? The existing parliament said, we're not really um, you know, in line with this, this program. Yeah, it, it, they essentially said, this may serve the country's best interest, but it doesn't necessarily serve our best interest. Or, you know, I'd be slightly more generous. <laughs> I don't think they say, we, we yeah. realize this would serve the country well, but we're simply selfish. I think as Madison himself recognized, people tend to identify what serves their own interests with the national yeah. interest. Sure. Very, very few, you know, sociopaths yeah. might say, I really don't care about anybody else or the country. I want mine and that's that. Most people want to look in the mirror and say, yeah. what serves my interest as if by magic also serves the interest of everybody else. Uh, and I yeah. have no doubt that the, that the members of the Icelandic parliament were sincere in believing that sticking with the status quo was better than accepting this radically new constitution. Yeah. Uh, but that's predictable. And so one aspect of design is not, is how do you get the design adopted? Right. It's, it's really very easy. I mean, you, you bring smart people in a room and you can easily come up with designs that might make the world a better place, but then you have to figure out how to get this adopted. And one crucial question is do you go through the existing institutions, or do you try to figure out end runs around existing institutions? And this, quite frankly, can and perhaps should sound very scary. Yeah. Uh, this is what makes constitutional design a radical process. Um, you know, the, 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 the framers in Philadelphia um, not only thought the existing system was imbecilic, but were more than willing to ignore the constraints that were established by the existing okay. system. And one of the most interesting of the Federalist essays is a defense for ignoring the rules handed down. And one ought to be nervous when you hear political reformers say, look, we not only have to change our policies, but we have to change the, the institutional structures within the policies. And the only, really, the way we will change them is to ignore them rather than to work through them. I mean, one of the things I really loathe about the United States Constitution is that it is so difficult to amend. Far more difficult than any of the state constitutions, far more difficult than most constitutions around the world. What this means is that it's almost utopian to involve yourself in an effort to amend the Constitution because you have to get the approval of two-thirds of each House of Congress and sure. three-quarters of the states. And what that means in every state except Nebraska, the approval of two legislative houses in the states. And why would a rational person like yourself 
invest your scarce time, money, and energy in what will be almost certainly a futile effort, right. be especially if we're talking about structures, which most people find boring. One of my favorite amendments is the 20th Amendment. The 20th Amendment passed in 1933 that moved Inauguration Day up to January 20th for March 4th and moved the time at which the new Congress would start from 13 months after the November election to the beginning of January. These were very important. I happen to think that it's crazy to wait until January 20th to inaugurate new presidents. Uh, in the modern world, given the compression of time, given the importance of having a president who can make certain decisions, uh, you know, let's not talk sure. about the yeah. 3 a.m. phone call, but simply we have international crises, et cetera. It would be good to have a president who had genuine political legitimacy, but this isn't on offer because if anybody ever talks about constitutional amendment, it's the kind of throwing red meat to the base sure. amendments. Let's, um, you know, let's make it criminal to burn the flag and stuff that is sure. truly and utterly irrelevant to the kinds of challenges that face us. So, I mean, we often say, you know, if it ain't broke, doesn't need fixing. I'm interested in kind of the obverse of that, where if we come to the conclusion that as a practical matter, we can't fix it because it's so difficult, then there is the psychological imperative to say, well, you know, it's probably not really broken. Because if you really and truly want to be depressed and pessimistic, it is to believe that our fundamental institutional structures are broken, but they may be impossible to fix without a quite radical sure. mass political movement. Uh, I hate the fact that we're out of time. I feel like we're just scratch scratching the surface. I know that if I lived anywhere near Harvard or Yale this semester or Austin, I would be auditing your classes and sneaking in. But let's thank Sandy for uh, just a, a thoughtful, amazing uh, moment this morning. Thank you.